Greetings and thanks for joining me for this video presentation on managing unexpected events. This is actually a reproduction of the Take Wing Aviation Quarterly Safety Meeting held on October 8, 2015. My name is Dorothy Schick. I'm the owner and flight instructor at Take Wing. We will be discussing why it's so important to prepare for the possibility of situations that can stretch our pilot capabilities and methods for preventing the loss of control accidents. I would like to thank Jay Mason, the original author of this presentation. We have adapted it for our own purposes here, but he is a fast uh, team rep out of Long Beach, California, and the author of the original presentation. In this presentation, we'll look at an example several examples of accidents caused by mismanaging an unexpected event, one at our own airport and another caused by cabin door opening shortly after takeoff. Then we'll look at examples of things that can happen in flight unexpectedly that can result in emergencies. And if not managed correctly, accidents. We'll take a look at the five stages of grief and how they might impact our decision making. And finally, we'll let you play a game that I'm calling What You Gonna Do and suggest some strategies for what to do and what to practice to be ready when or if unexpected events occur. So take a look at this graph. It's obviously no secret that GA accidents composed of loss of control are our greatest threat. Looking at this graph, you can see the percentages of loss of control accidents are the highest when our piloting tasks are the highest. During takeoffs and landings or the approach to landing phase. It's no coincidence that also at these portions are at flight time are the shortest. In other words, we spend the least amount of time but have the most number of accidents during takeoffs and landings. Nothing brings home the importance of emergency training than an accident involving pilots from our own airport. In this tragic event, two local pilots died. A grandfather, who was the pilot owner of the aircraft, and his adult grandson, who was a commercial pilot as well. For those of you who may not be familiar with the type of aircraft they were flying, this is a picture of it, the Luscom 8A. The ultimate reason behind this accident may never be known. The NTSB will not release a final report for some time, but we do know a few things from eyewitnesses. Here's what we do know. It was a beautiful VFR day. They had departed runway 33, and very shortly after, Two witnesses, one on the ground and one uh, turning from crosswind to downwind, heard one of the pilots declare an emergency and state there was an engine fire. Another witness on the ground heard the engine lose power. Witnesses saw the aircraft make a turn back to the runway. The left wing dropped and the aircraft abruptly nosed down and impacted the ground. And another example of a fairly classic example of an abnormal situation that was not managed well is the example of an accident that occurred at Deer Valley Airport in 2010 with a Cirrus SR-22. The pilot reported after takeoff that the door had opened and he would like to return back to land to close the door. So either because of distraction of the door being open noise, trying to close the door, or some combination of those. The pilot lost control of the aircraft while maneuvering to land. And what happened? The unexpected event turned into a very unfortunate accident and the death of the pilot. So where do we go from here? All of us learn how, to, how very important it is to prioritize tasks while we're flying. The three things pilots must do in order a priority or what? Well, we all should know this by now. Aviate. Maintain aircraft control at all times. Navigate. Manage your navigation systems. Look where you're going. 
and watch your fuel reserves and communicate both with passengers and air traffic control. Why is Aviate the number one priority? Well, think about it. It doesn't matter if we're navigating or communicating perfectly if we lose control of the aircraft and crash. So a couple of things to bear in mind. An unexpected event may or may not be an emergency event. Obviously, an emergency that happens is probably an unexpected event. So we have to consider that there are some situations which can catch us by surprise, and in many cases will take us by surprise if we have not practiced how we would handle these situations. And if they do take us by surprise and become an emergency situation, we want to handle them such that they don't evolve into a loss of control accident. It's obviously a partial or full loss of engine power right after takeoff. Landing gear that fails to retract after takeoff, or more, more commonly fails to extend when we're ready to land. A bird strike, or some kind of other control problem or failure, such as a runaway trim, a flat motor that fails to engage or disengage. And I'm sure you can think of some other ones, a prop failure, an alternator failure, engine roughness, carb ice, prop overspeed. These are just a few of the many kinds of unexpected events that can occur, which are going to get our attention. And the, of these unexpected events, many of them have or may have certain characteristics in common. Um, they often occur close to the ground or during a transition in flight from, say, one configuration or phase of flight to another. Our reaction time or the time we have to react is a small window after we go, what the? And almost always there's no time to pull out a checklist and read it. So our chances of success in improving our response to an abnormal event to prevent it from becoming more of an emergency is going to be greater if we think about it ahead of time and practice for the possibility. When a, an event surprises us, it's amazing how quickly we go through several emotional states. And we're going to use the analogy of these emotional states uh, to the five stages of grief, which were theorized by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Those uh, stages, and they may not happen in this order, but they are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So if we think about it in terms of aviation equivalence, denial would be this can't be happening. Anger might be that you're pissed off at the mechanic for whatever is occurring. Of course, you might also decide you want to bargain with the, the higher power to get you out of this. Uh, depression would be, and a good example of that would be sort of a resignation and basically saying, well, I'm toast. And then at the final one we might look at as acceptance is this is happening and I'll take action. So when dealing with an unexpected event, particularly if it's at low altitude on takeoff or landing, there is an element of surprise and fear. Talk to any pilot who has experienced an engine failure on takeoff who did not or would not tell you that there was a bit of denial and they're lying. Okay? It's often the case that you can somewhat practice this with your instructor. Imagine those situations that you've already had where you've been planning to practice emergencies after takeoff, engine failure, and you reach for the flap handle and all of a sudden the, your instructor pulls back the throttle to idle. That gets your attention. If we allow the other stages to eat up precious altitude or time, we're making the situation worse. So we must go directly to the acceptance that something has happened. But to do that, we have to do something else. And that something else is have a plan. That something else is practice. That something else is to rehearse 
possibilities in our heads and actually go out and practice with an instructor so we prepare. Most of you practice takeoff and landings till the cows come home and you practice go rounds either because you have to do them or because you want to do them. So think about this. The next time you look at your departure checklist, in your mind, you might have something as simple as adding in your mind at the point where you're briefing about what you're going to do on departure, that if an event occurs before rotation, I will abort. If it occurs below, say here at Crestwell, 1,500 feet MSL, about 1,000 feet above the ground, I will not turn back. That's a mental preparation all of us can do. I know we talk about fly the aircraft first. That's what we're talking about. But can we walk that talk? By that I mean, of course, are we really prepared to fly the airplane under the high stress that we will feel to a safe and perhaps off port airport landing? The pilot of this aircraft had a total engine failure, a mechanical one, not a fuel-related one. He was en route at a low altitude in Alaska, and navigation was simple. Just said, we'll be on the ground in a minute or two, well before we can get to anything that can even remotely look like an airport. Communication was simple. There was no one to talk to on the radio. And so, in this case, there, the likely outcome of success for this pilot was to think through what he would do in a, in a situation like this if it ever occurred, and he was prepared to deal with this problem. Everyone walked out alive. The theme should be obvious at this point in the presentation. Think about unexpected events that could happen ahead of time. Do it in the comfort of your home or your office. Do it where it's easier to think about your responses and have a plan. Let's return to the accident report regarding the Cirrus aircraft in which the door opened and the pilot decided to return to the airport to close it. This uh, SR-22 is equipped with two cabin doors, a left and right, and each door is equipped with an upper and lower door latch. When the door handle is actuated, both the upper and lower latches will release or lock. And of course, on the checklist from the POH, it says, as normal procedure, that all doors should be latched before flight. However, it also says that doors on the aircraft will remain, if they come open, will remain one to three inches open in flight. And if discovered during a takeoff roll, Go ahead and abort the takeoff if practical. If not, when airborne, reduce power to 80 or 90 knots and land as soon as practical. In other words, there's no danger to the aircraft control should the door come open during flight. In another event, completely different from the one we just discussed, a throttle cable broke and the engine was running at full power. This occurred while a student instructor were doing power off stalls and had just recovered from the stall. The instructor and pilot uh, handled the situation in the best way they knew how, which was they declared an emergency and they climbed and they went to a larger airport where they knew they had a longer runway. And then the instructor and the student worked together for a better outcome. So we're going to play a little game here. What you going to do? Let's say you're 75 feet in the air after takeoff, hear a big bang, and the engine starts shaking like an 8.3 earthquake. Once you've had a couple of seconds to think about it, I'm sure you'll do exactly what I did, which was lower the nose, meanwhile saying something derogatory about the aircraft, reducing the throttle, because the thing was shaking so badly, knowing that it was shaking and possibility of the engine shaking itself off the engine mounts, turn off the mags, and what? Land straight ahead. And all of this occurring within just a few seconds, probably no more than 30 seconds. Okay, here's another what you're going to do. Have you thought about a vacuum failure? If you're an IFR pilot, you sure have. What about if you're VFR at night? 
Would you fixate on it to the exclusion of other instruments? What would you do if it happened at night? Do you have sticky notes that you can cover the offending instrument with? And above all else, fly the airplane first. And that leads into the final portion of this presentation. The basic concept we've been discussing tonight is really about practice makes perfect. Of course we don't expect to have a surprise event. In my years of flying, I've only had a couple of them, but I have had a few. And the best thing we know about these is that if we practice or, or have an idea of what we should do during those situations, we will have a chance for a better outcome. So really, the only thing that's keeping us from potentially practicing for an unexpected event, an emergency, or perhaps surprise event, is denial that it's going to happen. And it might not ever happen to you. But why not play a game of what you're going to do? Grab someone, another pilot, or maybe a loved one, and sit in the airplane on a day when you're not going to go fly, and have them pull out a card and tell you it's an alternator failure, what are you going to do? Or tell you it's an engine failure, or tell you the door opens. Just work on and practice mentally what you're going to do while you're sitting in the airplane. And something else we should bring up. Since you're all members of Take Wing, we have an asset that many, many pilots wish they had. A full motion simulator that costs much less than running an aircraft and can be used for practice and rehearsing many kinds of surprises. Once a month, would it hurt you to step in the simulator and practice something that potentially would save your life? If you want some additional training on how to use a simulator, Eric and I am happy to help you. It's really simple and you'd be surprised how capable you'll be when you step out of it. So, final words. If an unusual or unexpected event does occur, we want you to be able to give the best performance of the lifetime. And I believe you can by practicing and preparing and maintaining that practice and preparation just like you do all your landings, all of your maneuvers each time you go fly.